All righty. Let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Very famous chapter. What do you all call this? Anybody know? What's it, what's it called? Uh huh. Somebody said it right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm going to show you this morning why it's the charity chapter, if you're going to call it that, not the love chapter. All right, First, First Corinthians 13 um, says, Though I speak with the tongues of man and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. By the way, this comes right after chapter 12, which deals with, with um, the, the church at Corinth, which was a big... Uh, it was probably a big church, and certainly a big city, a uh, big trading city, and very um, full of foreigners and people from all kinds of uh, nations because it's a major trading city. And so, obviously, in a church like that, when you get people saved, you're going to have people come to church that don't know the, the predominant language. And uh, they'll be excited. They want to give their testimony and praise the Lord, too. But, but you have to have order. So, you, so Paul um, established some rules or principles um, in, in, the, in that chapter. And, and also in chapter 14, he deals with it too, even more so in chapter 14. Um, but anyway, he talks about tongues. And of course, tongues is a big thing that's been used and abused. Um, and so I'll just say just briefly, tongues just means languages. That's all it means. You know, what tongue do you speak? He spoke in different tongues. And, and so when the disciples spoke in, in unknown tongues um, in Acts chapter 2, they didn't speak in tongues, languages are not known to anybody because all the people from all around the world said, how hear we every man in our own tongue the words of God? So the disciples spoke in tongues that they did not know, that they never learned. They never went to school and learned it. God gave them that ability to speak so that people who did speak those languages that were there in Jerusalem could hear the preaching and understand it. See? So... It's not, I feel the spirit, you know. <laughs> no, that's the devil's, that's Satan's counterfeit tongues. So, um, but anyway, so I'm not going to spend any more time on that. So, but that's the previous thing and so, uh, subject. And so he says in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity. So big deal. Who cares how many languages you can speak? Paul spoke many languages. So he says the most important thing is, is that you have charity. He says, if I, if I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And, uh, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and uh, like all prophecies of when Jesus is coming and so forth, and though I have all faith, by the way, nobody does, but he's, he's making, um, uh, what do you call it, a uh, hypothetical. Thank you. Um, stay out of my preaching. <laughs> Brother Hiles used to do that all the time. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but, and, and have all faith so that I could move mountains. Man, I have never known anybody to move a mountain. By just saying, I have faith, mountain be gone. Never seen that. Uh, um, by the way, you can move mountains. I've moved mountains, just not that way. See, our mind goes in that direction. But anyway, uh, so th though you do all these things and have not charity, or though I do all these things, Paul says, I am n what? Nothing. 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 That's a shocking statement. Because doesn't, doesn't God want us to have faith? Didn't, wasn't Jesus looking for faith? Isn't Jesus going to be looking for faith when he comes? Yeah. He said, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? I don't know about you, but he better find grace. It's more important that he find grace than that he find faith. According to this verse, right? Though I have all faith. That's shocking. I mean, I, I have I put great stock in faith. I think we ought to have faith in God's word. But when he says, I am nothing, it means I am nothing to other people. It won't do any good 
I believe the Bible, and I don't have charity, it won't do anybody else any good. See? And uh, well, he, goes, he goes on and says, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, like as a martyr for Christ, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. People can do, give their goods to feed the poor, but they're doing it for show, for glory, and so forth. So, now you get in the, the famous section, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity bondeth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now, so all these descriptions, a lot of people just substitute the word love for the word charity. So people will swap out and, and they'll, because charity, you know, three syllables and love is one easy one. But then you have to get into all this stuff about, well, what kind of love is it? Is it agape love or phileo love or whatever? Now, it doesn't matter. It's all wrong. Charity is not love. And, and if we learn what our English words were, then we wouldn't be fooled by the devils trying to stick something in there that God didn't, didn't put. The word charity, well, the root word of the word charity comes from the Greek word charis, which means grace. It's grace. So, um, so ch charity is, is graciousness. It's, it's grace. It's where, where you do what you may not initially want to do, but somebody needs it. See, remember God was not willing to make us subject to vanity where we could sin and do all. But he reasoned it out, see, because he wanted to show his grace to us. Um, so, uh, but that's, the, that's what the word means. It just means grace. And uh, so now let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And we'll probably go back to that, so you might want to hold your place there. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's start with verse 10. Colossians 3.10. And have put on the new man... Um, well, verse 8 says, Now ye also put off all these, and then verse 10, and have put on the new man, oh, because of verse 9, yeah, that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So if the new man is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, well, wh whose image is that? Whose image are we in when we're born again? Yes, we're, we're, in, we're in Jesus' image, God's image, the image of God. Okay? See, man by nature is not in the image of God anymore. Originally was, but when Adam sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, their spirit died. So man is basically by nature a, a uh, dichotomy, a two, a two, two in one uh, creature. With a body and a soul, but spirit's dead. I guess you could say we got, we got one, but it's a dead one. And uh, needs to be quickened, made alive. That happens when we put our faith and trust in Christ as our Savior. We're quickened and made alive. We're born again by the Word of God, which lived and by forever. When we receive the Word of God and believe it and put our faith and trust in Christ because of the Word of God. So, uh, then we're born again. And that which is, and so we're renewed in knowledge after the image of the creating Him. So, it's after the image of God. Well, what's the, mo what's the most important thing about God? The most important thing about God is that God showed His grace toward us. It's the grace of God. That's why Paul closes his epistles. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over and over. First thing mentioned, grace. See, We wouldn't have peace if it weren't for the grace of God. And that's why Titus says, uh, And the grace of God that appeared to all men, teaching us to... Uh, that. Uh, I have it memorized, but anyway, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, uh, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 
So it's the grace of God that appears to all men. It's the grace of God that God wants us to share with other people. And uh, of course God loves him, but it's his grace that he'd be willing to give us something that we don't deserve. It's the fact that we, the wage of sin is death, but, that word but, shows the grace of God. We deserve to die and go to hell, every one of us, but God's grace stepped in. See, so, uh, now let's, let's look further here. So, at, based on that, in that situation, when you're renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, in that condition, there is neither, or there is neither Greek nor Jew. It doesn't matter what your nationality is. When you're born again, your spirit's not born. Um, what's your nationality, Nathan? Maine. Maine. I know. Right, maybe a bunch. Do you even know? Because I was born in America, but you mean like... Yeah, your you're, you're, you're ethnic... Uh, background, I should say. Like Your families. Yeah. From, grandparents uh, or whatever. Yeah, all, all my grandparents were first generation uh, immigrants uh, from Sweden and then uh, Poland and Romania. Okay. So three. All right. But you know what? When you got born again, your spirit wasn't any one of those. No. Not a single one. It's after the image of God. See? Edward, you're, you got Indian in you, right? And what else? A little bit of Tejano. A little bit what? Tejano. Tejano? Never heard of that. Like a, uh, my grandpa's okay. in Texas. Oh, oh, a Tex. Oh, so you're a Texan. Yeah. A Texan Hispanic, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. All right. But when you got born again, your spirit, it's not that. Yeah. It's not that at all. I got all kinds. Of, I don't know. I lost track. But, um, but mostly English. I found not almost no German. I always thought it was German, but my, my sister... Told me, no, 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 huh? Yeah, yeah, we're mostly Irish, yeah. That's why you're so mad! <laughs> That's why I blow my top! Uh, no, I have an excuse. Um, no, but anyway, but my spirit, it's not any of that. Not on, none of us. So you see, that's why the Bible says, says um, avoid endless genealogies. It just doesn't matter because whoever your grand, great, great, great grandparents were, that's not who your great 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 grandparents were. Because we all come from Noah and we all come from <laughs> Adam. See? So it, it doesn't matter. And so, so there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor insert. That's an outward thing. But once we're, we're saved, we've got the circumcision of heart, but it has nothing to do with the, the, the fleshly circumcision. Nothing whatsoever. So we're neither that. Nor, nor barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free. I don't care if you're born a slave or born in debt. Like, we're all born slaves in America now because we're... Just, anyway, uh, in a way, because um, we're all born in debt because of stupid Congress getting out of control or stupid people letting Congress get out of control. But anyway, so, but my spirit's free. My spirit is not in debt. My spirit owes nothing. See? So, so Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, because of that, put on. Because you have the outside, but you got some inside that has nothing to do with the outside. God says, put on. In other words, make evident what's on the inside. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, and that's what your spirit is. It's holy. It never sins. And it's very beloved. God loves that he has something to communicate with in you besides orally and, you know, where he has to wait on you to read his word. You know, you can meditate on his word and your heart can just sense the, the, the presence of the Lord in your life. And you can have a wonderful, wonderful time with your eyes closed. You don't need to be in church. You can be at work. You can be anywhere. If Christ dwells within you and you've been born again, you can have mountaintop experience in the valley physically. No matter what. That's why Paul and Silas rejoiced when they're in prison with their hands and feet in stocks and had been beaten because they had Christ dwelling within. They'd been born again. So, 
So put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. These are all really good things. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, these are all great things, but look what's above all these things. Put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity is the bond of perfectness. Now, I've got to review a little bit the word perfect. Perfect comes from the root word fact, fact or, or like manufacturing. It means to make or do. Okay? And, and per, per comes like, is like the like perimeter. It means all the way around. Um, or thoroughly. Um, so when you do something thoroughly, you, you do it all in all points. Like Jesus is tempted thoroughly. He is tempted in all points like as we are. So I like to think of it as like all the points in a circumference. All 360 degrees or all 720 half degrees or whatever. I mean, all points are covered or complete and are, are, are made. And uh, so charity is the, is the bond of perfectness. It's what holds all these other points together. Uh, if you're going to be, if you're going to have mercy, have bowels of mercy, you're going to have to have charity to do that. You're going to have to have grace in your heart towards someone in order to show them mercy. Because sometimes we just don't want to show mercy, do we? So sometimes we don't think someone deserves mercy. But hey, do we deserve mercy? No, we don't. I didn't deserve to be saved because I went to church all the time, read my Bible, and memorized chapters and verses. I don't deserve mercy. Or I don't de yeah, I don't deserve mercy. But it's the grace of God that gave me mercy. And so it is the grace of God in our lives, our graciousness towards other people that's going to allow us, enable us to forgive when they've done us wrong and repented. You know, sometimes people say, they do you wrong and they, they don't repent. They don't ask for forgiveness. Well, man, if a sinner doesn't ask for forgiveness, does he get forgiveness from God? No, he does not. So why don't we apply that in our lives? Because we've got a bunch of liberal people teaching our universities, giving us wrong definitions, and teaching us, oh, we've got to forgive everybody. Not if they don't ask. I mean, that's, that's like crazy. That, that throws all doctrine out the window. Now, you should, have, you should have grace in you. You should have the charity so that if they ever do, it doesn't matter how much they've heard or how long it takes them to repent, as soon as they do, boom, you forgive. So you have it available like the, like the gift of God is eternal life. But he doesn't force it on anybody. And we're not supposed to force forgiveness on people who haven't even repented. Oh, I forgive you. I forgive the person, that whoever killed my nephew or whatever, I forgive you. No, you should say, if whoever killed my neighbor is to repent and come and ask for forgiveness, I'll give it to you. I got good news for you, but you don't have it until you ask. That would be biblical. And that would, that, that would teach people responsibility. So anyway, um, so charity uh, is very, very important. Above all these things, put on charity. So, charity um, leads to mercy. Charity leads to kindness. If you put on charity, you can be kind when you don't feel like it. Charity will also cause humbleness of mind because you realize, I've received the grace of God. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to realize, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to forget what a sinner I am. And that gives you a humbleness of mind. Before you judge somebody else, remember, you needed God's grace. Now, you might ought to give them some grace. Give them a little bit of, you know, don't ride somebody just because you know better. It, you know, it's, it's funny how people judge other people and, and get on to other people for things and they just learned it 10 minutes ago. <laughs> you know, they just learned something in the last year, or last five years or ten years, and then and they don't have enough grace to allow someone else to 
go through the process of learning it themselves. See, that's called humbleness of mind as a result of grace in our, working in our lives. And uh, meekness, which is kind of the same thing. Meekness is lowliness of mind. It means, it comes from the word, it means to submit. It means me- meekness. Moses was the most meekest man in all the world, God said. Why? Because he, he had great a, a position where he could exercise a lot of power, didn't he? He had abilities. He had, he had power from God. And he, he was in charge. Pe- millions of people were following him. But what did he do? I just do what God tells me to do. He didn't say, okay, I'm, I'm head, head of this show. I'm going to run it the way I want. No, he ran it the way God told him to. And by the way, that's the way every pastor should be. But too many preachers walk in the flesh. I this, I want to do that, and, and it's my way or the highway. It should be God's way or the highway. <laughs> I mean, after all, is Jesus Christ not the head of this church? Then things ought to be done His way. And the pastor is supposed to lead the people to do things God's way. So, um, all right, homeless of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Oh, my soul, is God ever long-suffering? He has suffered long. He suffered in eternity's worth for all of our sins. And he suffered long in our lifetimes, waiting for us to get some things, get some truths, and learn some things. He is long-suffering. And by the way, he does suffer because we take so long to learn some things. So if we can cause him to suffer so long, why can't we be willing to suffer a long time when other people aren't doing what we wish they would do when we wish they would do it? But if we have graciousness, if we have charity, charity suffereth long. 1 Corinthians 13. Remember? We saw that. All right? Why? It's the bond of perfectness. It covers all these. It's the glue that holds all these together, that makes all these to be set in their place. They can, you can add these things. You can add mercifulness and kindness and humbleness and meekness. and long. You can add those to your life if you have grace and charity because that's the bond. That's the glue. It'll make those other things stick. All right? Um, forbearing one another. That means bearing one another a four time before. That's like when you go to church. Say, oh, I wonder if so-and-so is going to sit by me again. Oh, man, he stunk last time. <laughs> I make it up stuff. I'm not thinking of anybody. Believe me, I'm not. But, <laughs> but, but if, you know, oh, well, that means you go anyway and you bear it. Knowing ahead of time, you bear it. Doesn't God have to bear us knowing ahead of time he knows the future? God knows about the next time you're going to backslide. But he's forbearing. And you know what? As a pastor, I have to forbear. Especially I forbear. That's one, of the, that's one of the hardest things for pastors. Is putting up with people living like a yo-yo. But you know what? Here's why I can do so well. Because I look back on my life and, hmm, I kind of did that too. <laughs> so guess what? I'm going to be very forbearing. And that's, I believe I am. And that's why. Because that's what I see in Scripture. We all need to forbear one another. Because none of us is perfect. None of us is going to be totally in the image of Christ until we see Him. So we're all going to be yo-yos. We're just a bunch of yo-yos. <laughs> but I always like yo-yos. You know, you can do amazing things with yo-yos. So let's let God do some amazing things with us. Okay? Amen? All right. So uh, what else? Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. I kind of talked about that already. That means you give before. I used that illustration from the teenagers I led to the Lord Friday night. Uh, I used the illustration of someone broke a window. And, uh, and, and you f- turns out, boy, you can't wait to make them pay until you find out it's a friend who doesn't have money. And you love your friend, so what do you do? You pay it. You forgive. You're willing to give before. In fact, in fact, if a better illustration, if you know it ahead of time, you're playing and, all right, be careful. Well, let's, let's, let's play ball, but let's be careful. But if you're playing with friends, you already make up your mind that if any of your friends break your window, you're going to pay for it. 
because you love them. If any of them that don't have money, that is. If they got money, let them pay. But, <laughs> but no, uh, but what I'm saying, you're willing to give beforehand. And that's what God did. God gave his only begotten son, but he gave him before the world was made, before he founded the earth, the world. So uh, that's what forgiveness is. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So he spends some time on that. And above all these, put on charity. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Let's finish up there. 1 Corinthians 13 again. Now with, now with that understanding, fuller understanding, let's look at it again. Let's read some of this. Starting with verse 4. Charity suffereth long. Yeah, we just saw long suffering, didn't we? Yeah. Charity suffereth long. Be gracious no matter how long you have to be gracious. And offer that to offer it to people. Charity is kind. We saw kindness in Colossians 3. Charity envieth not. Why? Remember I talked about envy uh, Sunday night, was it? Or Wednesday night. Yeah, Wednesday night. I think. Um, our proverb study. It means to look into something else. You know, I wonder what so-and-so is doing. I wonder, I wonder how he got could afford that car. And you get envious because you're looking at somebody else's business. Charity doesn't do that because graciousness is glad for other people to have good things. You don't have to look into, well, how, how, how could he afford that? How? You don't have to worry about it. Be glad he has it. See, graciousness is, is uh, it envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It, <laughs> that's an antithetical to, to grace. And it vaunteth not itself. No, it's graciousness is caring about other people. And wanting to give to them what they don't deserve. So you're not going to vaunt yourself if you're trying to help someone else. And is not puffed up. It's, it's, it's similar. Um, I won't spend time on that. Verse 5, charity, it doth not behave itself unseemly. Now, unseemly means it doesn't seem like that's right. So graciousness is going to behave in a way where everybody say, wow, that is really good that so-and-so was so gracious. Nobody says, that's unseemly. No, it's all like wonderful. Like since I talked about um, uh, soul winning Friday night, I talked about there's a guy who was watching some MMA fighting on TV when we got there. And, uh, and God just happened to have someone send me an email with a link to an MMA fight. So I'd watched an MMA fight on, on YouTube. Uh, interesting. And it was so interesting because it was someone famous uh, who is dominating his women's MMA. Believe that? Women fighting like that and kicking and anyway and punching. But anyway, um, but, uh, but anyway, in that championship fight, the, before the fight, uh, when they were standing in the center, the current champion, Ronda Rousey, uh, was fighting a girl named Holly Holm. Holly Holm at the end said, all right, touch gloves if you want. And Holly stuck her gloves out, and the champion just snubbed her, stuck her nose near, turned away, and walked away. And just, just you know, no grace whatsoever. Um, so um, it just didn't seem right. just didn't seem right. You at least start off, you know, respecting one another. But she didn't respect uh, so, no grace there, no charity. Um, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own. Um, I'll tell you, I was impressed with Holly Holm. After she knocked out Ronda Rousey, second round, uh, beat her, dominated her, and then knocked her out with a kick to the head. Uh, and Ronda was laying, laying out there, people were, were sitting her up, trying to get her up, see if she's okay. Holly came home, came over and just on one knee and just kind of looked, make sure she's all right. Just stood there watching, see how she's doing. See. She's, she was, she was not concerned about herself. She wasn't seeking her own glory. Oh, I didn't know. She did right away when she realized that she knocked her out. She shouted, but then right away. She, and, and, you know, most other people, you know, be on the ropes and yeah, yeah, and stirring up the crowd. Holly just stood there. And then she, once she got up from there, she was sober. The rest of the she was, she was not, whoo-hoo. No, she wasn't living in the moment. She was thinking about a person that she'd had respect for, which she said so. 
And, uh, but anyway, so <laughs> bring that worldly stuff into an illustration. But it does illustrate it, and, it was, and it's fresh on my mind. So uh, don't own. If you, how, how can a person seek their own things and, and claim any grace? And, uh, man, I, 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 I loved it. Um, we were talking, when, I forget when it was. Must have been, uh, yeah, Thursday morning when I came to y'all's home. And uh, Brother Hickson told me, told me something I'd never heard it put quite this way. He said, um, the secret to marriage is, is when you put, when one spouse puts the other spouse in first place between the two of course God first place but but you put your spouse ahead of yourself see that's that's grace see that's grace okay um so let's go on uh, I bet I'd probably better quit I'll let you do some homework go through it and just apply graciousness to all the rest of these um definitions of charity um Substitute grace instead of love. And, uh, and you'll, you'll understand. You'll get more understanding. And by the way, grace never fails. See, if grace can't fail. It's impossible for grace to fail. Because of what the nature of grace. Grace is giving somebody what they don't deserve. Giving somebody what they do not deserve when they need it and ask for it never fails. See, God, that's why when the Bible says the grace of God appeareth to all men, it never fails. See? Because someday when those who reject His grace stand before God, the fact that God showed them His grace and that appeared to them will be on record. And it will never fail. It's like it will accomplish that for which it was sent, either to get people to receive it or to reject it. And grace is the same way. So when you're gracious, somebody might reject it, but your grace will not fail. It won't be a waste. It can be used as a testimony against you. So, so let's, let's be gracious uh, towards one another and especially towards unsaved folks. That's why we go so when We don't say, well, you, I'm not, I don't want to stand up and say, well, you didn't come to church, so... Uh, you, know, you, you deserve to go to hell. I'm not on judgment day. Well, you, Lord, they never came to church, so. But Jesus is going to say, well, didn't you go? The fact, soul winning is all about grace. Folks that, folks that aren't willing to come to church still ought to hear about the love of Christ. They may not hear about it, but then neither did we. So we take it to them. We baby them. We feed it to them like a milk bottle. We have to, we have to try to get them into grace. See, so let's put on grace as the bond of perfectness. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, your goodness. Thank you for this good word, and thank you for giving us words in our language uh, that that are that are put together in such a way that if we really study what words mean in our language, we can know what you mean. And we can get so much more blessings out of your word. So bless us with this Bible study. And bless the service to follow too. In Jesus name we pray. Amen.